Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to cross-border interlinking of fast payment systems, experiences, challenges and opportunities. This is a webinar jointly organized by Banca d'Italia and the Monetary Authority of Singapore in connection with the Italian G20 Presidency. I'm Joe from the MES and I'm delighted to be your session manager for the first half of this program. The G20 has made enhancing cross-border payments a priority. It has set out a challenge for the global community to work towards faster, cheaper, more transparent and more inclusive cross-border payment systems while maintaining safety and soundness. Today, we bring together the global experts and leading proponents of this approach to share their perspectives and inform our collective way forward. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to extend our sincere thanks to all our speakers. Before we commence, please allow me to walk you through a few housekeeping matters. First, please note that this uh, webinar is recorded. Second, please ensure that your cameras and microphones are turned off for better connectivity when you're not speaking. Feel free to post your questions to the Q&A box at any point. The Q&A box is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If time permits, I will invite presenters to respond to selected questions, seeking clarification of their material at the end of their presentation. Now, broader questions on views and approaches will be taken at the general discussion towards the end of the session. In the event that you encounter any technical issues, please look for Andrea or Camilla in the chat and they will assist you. I now have the privilege of handing over the floor to Mr. Luigi Canari, head of the Banca d'Italia's Directorate General for Markets and Payment Systems to open this conference. Mr. Canari, please. Thank you, John, and good afternoon. Good morning, good uh, evening, depends on where you are. It's my great pleasure to open this webinar on cross-border interlinking of fast payment systems jointly organized by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank of Italy with a view to supporting the activities that are to be carried out uh, within the G20 roadmap for the enhancement of global cross-border payments. Faster, less expensive, more transparent and inclusive cross-border payments are a crucial ingredient to support growth, international trade, tourism and migratory flows. Progress in this area is particularly urgent for low value payments, including remittances, which typically incur high fees as a percentage of the amount exchanged and are delayed by lengthy and cumbersome processes. Enhancing cross-border payments has become a priority of the international agenda. This is confirmed by the wealth of activities recently carried out by several international bodies, among others the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures and the Financial Stability Board. The G20 roadmap, which was launched by the G20 Saudi Presidency in 2020 and drawn up by the Financial Stability Board, represents a key step forward in this field. It envisages a wide range of actions aimed at addressing the frictions that affect the exchange of payments across jurisdictions. Interconnecting the existing payment system is the focus of one of the building blocks, namely the 13th. Interlinking existing systems is arguably a practical, relatively quick and parsimonious solution to increase the efficiency of cross-border transactions. Leveraging on existing infrastructures significantly reduces the implementation time and other things being equal the related cost. Moreover, interlinking infrastructures may be seen as the first natural step of a process that may gradually evolve towards centralized platforms. At the same time, establishing interlinking across jurisdictions entails some challenges in terms of operating hours, currency, currency conversions, risk management, and operational policies. A careful design of the interlinking is therefore crucial. Fast payment systems are the best candidates for being interlinked for the purposes of the goals set out in the roadmap. For instance, they tend to be operational on a 24-7 basis, 
thus ensuring the complete overlapping of operating hours across jurisdictions. Today's event brings together actors running existing interlinking arrangements or actively involved in delivering new ones, as well as other innovative facilities. The experience they have gained so far is a valuable mine of information that can cast light on best practices and the most effective solutions for delivering efficient cross-border payments. The first section in which deputy governors of the central banks of Saudi Arabia, Italy and Indonesia, G20 presidents for last, this and next year respectively, will provide an overview for, of progress so far and outline the next steps. Before I leave the floor, I wish to thank the organized committee and in particular our colleagues at the Monetary Authority of Singapore for helping to put together such a rich and interesting program. Finally, I wish you all panelists, presenters, discussants and other participants a most fruitful and enriching discussion. Thank you all and back to you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Canari. May I now invite Mr. Sopnandu Moranti, Chief Fintech Officer of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, to give his opening remarks, please. Hi, Joe. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I have a little blister on my tongue, so I'll be speaking in a strange way. So please excuse me for that. Uh, it's just early morning blisters. Well, um, we are quite pleased to co-host this important webinar on the cross-border payment linkages with BGL. Uh, I think our view on the payment uh, is around interoperability. Uh, it's one of the key pillars for foundational digital infrastructure and other pillars being the digital identity with trusted, uh, citizen-centric uh, authorization and consent and uh, level playing uh, data exchange infrastructure. Having a trusted digital identity definitely unlocks uh, universal access to public and private digital services. Uh, it builds that confidence and trust we need in a digital economy. Uh, similarly, a citizen-centric, robust, authorized, and consent layer fosters public confidence and digital transactions are safe so that they are safe and secure uh, through proper mechanisms. And same time, secure data exchange allows safe accessibility of user data by third parties for the provision of key services such as national planning, credit scoring, and so on. And we have seen that countries which have implemented this infrastructure uh, are and will be able to plug seamlessly into the global digital economy, unlocking the ability for citizens and businesses to make end-to-end -end digital transactions across border at lower cost and greater convenience. As a step in this direction, MAS, worked with the central banks of Brunei, Cambodia, Ghana, and Kenya, and MasterCard to publish a report on foundational digital infrastructure for inclusive digital economies. This report is available on our website, and I strongly encourage everyone to read it. Now, coming to cross-border payments, there are many initiatives that leverage emerging technologies to tackle the challenges of cross-border payments today. Central banks are encouraged, uh, are encouraging these initiatives to premise on openness and interoperability. Solutions should not function in silos. So it has to interoperate. Standardized global protocols are key to interoperability and the global community need to actively promote the adoption in system design. MAS has applied these principles to our pay now linkages with our counterpart systems. Today, we are now linked with PNA, uh, linked our PNA with Thailand's PromPay, and are working to link with Malaysia's Do, uh, Do, it, Do it Now and uh, India's UPI. Uh, these linkages allow retail cost, uh, users to send cross border remittance seamlessly in real time at very low cost. Uh, around 3% of value, uh, um, around 3% of the value remitted, uh, uh, which is, which is, if you compare against uh, uh, ex existing rails, uh, which can go all the way to 10 to 15%. And the, and the people, when we're able to send money between uh, two the beneficiaries and the, and the, and the, and the remitters, uh, just by knowing each other mobile phone number. 
The linkage with Thailand went live in April and have registered healthy growth with almost 100,000 transactions totaling 26 million, uh, I think, US dollar in values and is continuing continue to rise further. What is really important about this particular linkage is, is the ability to, for a small value transfer to happen almost every week, which clearly signals that if you have an efficient payment system, the cost of transfer goes down and you are able to facilitate more cross-border remittance, especially for migrant workers sending money back home. We have colleagues from BCS, operator of the pay off system, here today to share more on the linkages. Uh, while bilateral linkages have their merits, we need to build quickly towards multilateral interoperability. MAS is working with the BIS Innovation Hub on Project Nexus, which charts out a common blueprint for countries to fully integrate the systems onto a single cross-border network. Um, our pay now uh, linkages will feed into this uh, blueprint, contribute useful learnings on jurisdiction specific needs in addition to general interoperability requirement. My colleague, uh, Andrew from BIS Innovation Hub will share more today. As we solve for faster, cheaper, and more efficient payments clearing uh, systems, we need to think further ahead about addressing the deep-rooted issues of cross-border settlements and horizontals like AML and CFT requirement. MAS is working with a number of partners, including those, participant, those participating today, to explore the use of blocked-in solutions like wholesale CBDC to resolve this. And I am personally, personally quite excited that, the, that if we can find a DLT-based uh, uh, system which can specially tackle the settlement and clearing process, this can, this can go in a long way to solve, especially cross-border transfers, uh, operational inefficiency we have today. Our work today is one step in a long journey to unlock the ability for all our users to send payments across the global instantly, securely, and with fees less than 1%. So that's quite an, uh, a, a, a stiff uh, goal for all of us because today getting below 1% uh, cost for cross-border payment is, is it seems to be very difficult because the best we could achieve is close to three to two percent. MAS remains keen to work with like-minded partners to bring about greater digital inclusion and interoperability of payments. With that, let me thank the BDL and today's speakers on their contribution to make this joint conference possible and beneficial for all of us. Uh, thank Joe, and uh, that's a short remark from my from my side. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Chief, and we heard you loud and clear. Thank you so much. Now, the ongoing effort by countries to interlink their fast payment systems has played a key role in meeting the objectives outlined by the G20 Cross-Border Payments Roadmap. The roadmap was initiated by the Saudi G20 Presidency in 2020, was advanced by the Italian Presidency this year, and will be developed further by the Indonesian Presidency in 2022. It is therefore fitting that we have senior representatives from the central banks of the G20 Troika here to give the G20 perspective. Now, please allow me to welcome Dr. Fahad Al Dusari, Deputy Governor for Research and International Affairs at the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, Mr. Piero Cipolloni, Deputy Governor of the Banca d'Italia, and Mr. Dodi Budi Waluyo, Deputy Governor of Bank Indonesia. Let me first invite Dr. Aldosari to take the floor. Dr. Aldosari, please. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Let me start by thanking uh, Bank Italia and also the Monetary Authority of Singapore for, for inviting us to, to speak um, in this event. Also uh, thanking the Italian G20 Presidency and the Financial Stability Board for their continuing work on the G20 cross-border payments Roadmap. Uh, we acknowledge the, uh, the importance of this work and we uh, emphasize the need for continuous cooperation between members to achieve the objectives of the roadmap and reach the milestones set. Um, the work to date has been uh, phenomenal, especially given the, the fact that many countries are still dealing with the, with the pandemic. We have been significant 
uh, uh, we have made significant strides in reaching milestones and the G20 cross border uh, without any major delays, uh, which reflects the will shared by most countries to enhance cross border payments. We welcome the finalization uh, of the target report uh, to the G20 and their endorsement. This political endorsement is essential because public as well as private sector involvement and actions are key to achieve those targets. I believe targets are suitably ambitious, but they are definitely achievable by 2027. Uh, a key aspect of realizing our ambition uh, that laid out in the roadmap would be the concept of interlinking uh, of payment systems. Uh, we can see significant benefits to this approach in terms of addressing many of the frictions associated with cross-border payments, most notably the friction caused by long transaction chains uh, may benefit from interlinking, as well as this uh, uh, can reduce the, the number of intermediaries involved, increases speed, reduces cost, and uh, enhances transparency. This is especially the case where the interlinking of fast systems uh, to other fast systems located in different jurisdictions, which operate on a 24-7, 365 day uh, basis. However, like all solutions, there are challenges, which we will hear more about during the course of, of today. Um, uh, I would like to, to build on, on the last point where the benefits of interlinking are greater with the fast payment systems. This requires significant investment in domestic payment systems. For example, uh, in Saudi Arabia, we introduced our new fast payment system in February this year. One key design criteria was uh, it's being based on the ISO 2022 which is now the de facto messaging standard for financial uh, industry. This will help uh, facilitate greater interoperability uh, with other payment systems in the future and build on our work to uplift our domestic uh, payment systems. In terms of broad or uh, the, the broader uh, agenda of enhancing cross-border payment, SAMA continues to support all initiatives taking place in this regard, namely the Arab Monetary Fund's sponsorship and development of BUNA. Uh, I believe more details will, will be discussed and we will hear uh, later in, in, in this event. Uh, specifically in our region and the, the Gulf region, under the sponsorship of the Gulf Cooperation countries, the GCC, the Arab Gulf System for Financial Automated uh, Quick Payments Transfer, AFA, uh, service was introduced earlier this year. AFA uh, links the RTGS systems of the GCC countries while the technical aspects uh, of it is not considered interlinking. However, the arrangements has many of the benefits of interlinking fast systems and addresses many uh, of the frictions associated with cross-border payment in general. Uh, they are as follows. Uh, the system is a multi-jurisdictional system underpinned by legal, regulatory, and governor's framework developed by GCC countries. It eliminates loan transaction chain as no correspondent banks are necessary to intermediate the chain. There are common data standards for uh, payments messages. The cost associated with funding and settlement are greatly reduced uh, as all funding and settlement activities are handled by existing RTGSs uh, and the respective central banks. Um, in, in my concluding remarks, uh, I very much look forward to uh, the various presentations during the day, which will further explore the benefits and challenges of interlinking in general, but more specifically of interlinking past systems. We are keen to continue uh, with our Indonesian colleagues on the work on uh, of uh, enhancing cross-border payments as priority 
during their chair, uh, chairmanship of the G20, and we would like to offer them our full support. Thank you and best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldassari. Mr. Cipolloni, for the Italian G20 presidency, please. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, depending on, on where you are. Um, much of what I was going to say has been already said. So for the sake of time, let me jump to basically the, the, key, the key messages that I want to, to deliver today in these opening remarks. But first, I want to obviously thank uh, Mr. Afad Aldossari and Mr. Dodi Budivaluyo for taking the time to, to opening this, this important, um, this important uh, web uh, seminar. Um, as a G20 presidency, we have been uh, fully behind the roadmap uh, set first by the, the Saudi Arabia. And we have been working on all the, the 19 building blocks, providing our support and uh, our convening power as a presidency. But our focus has been especially on the interoperability, because we think that uh, the interoperability of the existing system are the crucial step. It might be at an interim solution, but it's ready-made and we can progress very fast on this direction, delivering to the needs of the people that are out there waiting for us to do something. So that's why we thought that focusing on the uh, interoperability is uh, key at this juncture, especially while people are suffering around the world because of the pandemic. Um, and we think that there are merits in focusing on focusing in uh, interoperating the existing system while obviously exploring for the next generation of fast payment system, which may be, you know, um, re uh, built on new technical solutions such as CBDC. While we work on the future, we have to deliver now because people are waiting for us. So uh, at the Bank of Italy, we are really have been pushing very hard on this. We. Back in September, we organized a, a major conference on this issue just to take stock of what has been done and uh, put our political support behind this, behind this um, agenda. And we will support the upcoming uh, Indonesian presidency for what we can to keep going along, along this, this line. We are working also at the bilateral level. We have been, as, as uh, Mr. Aldosar just said, we had worked on a linking on you know, linking tips, which is the European fast payment system with the with the BUNA. And uh, and it's clear that can be done at the technical level, can be done. It's not that hard. What we need is a political commitment to solve all the other issues. What does that is called the business interoperability that goes beyond that goes beyond the, the remits of the central bank. But the central bank can do much. Can do, can do much, um, especially by experimenting, learning, figuring out what the difficulties might be and how to overcome, overcome this. So we don't have, we have to rely on our technical expertise to overcome the technical pro problem and rely on our, on our uh, political convening power to push our governments to, to do something on the business interoperability. I want to, I want to conclude because I don't want to, to take too much of your time by saying that experimentation, which is the one, what we can do, it's not cheap. I mean, I know that it requires considerably human resources and fun, human and financial resources, but I also think that they are well working, worth deploying to, to reap the benefits provided by interoperable payment system at the global level. We are aware of the complexity of the task at the end, and uh, we are, you know, experimenting the, beyond the, the bilateral dimension. We are also working at the multilateral dimension. We will join, we will join the, the monetary authority of Singapore and Bank of Malaysia in uh, experimenting the nexus process because we believe there is, a, there is value on that. We will do that again. This is going to cost. This is going to cost um, uh, 
financial and human resources, but uh, we, 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 need to, we need to step up uh, and to rise to the challenge. Let me, let me quote on this uh, a sentence. Uh, I am Italian, so you know, we cannot escape from quoting Latin uh, philosopher, but this is uh, an important one. Let me quote the, the words of a uh, philosopher Seneca. Uh, he said, not est ad astra mollis et erbis via, which means there is no easy way from the hair to the stars. So we have to think about and be, be able to, <clears throat> to support the, the effort which is required. Um, let me conclude quickly by thanking all the organizer for putting together such an important and interesting program. And uh, again, I welcome all the participants to, to, this, to this seminar. Thank you, Joe, and back to you. Thank you, Mr. Cipollone. Indeed, uh, fortune favors the brave. May I now invite Mr. Waluyu to offer perspectives on how the roadmap will be taken forward under the, Italian, under the Indonesian G20 presidency of 2022. Mr. Waluyu, please. Thank you, Joe. Um, First, uh, thank you for everybody. I think uh, uh, it's very uh, honor for us to have a time here to at least give a very brief on what our presidency uh, will take on the uh, topic on the uh, payment system. I think recognizing that the world is in dire need of safe, faster and cheaper while maintaining the safety and security, the G20 has made enhancing cross-world payments a priority during Saudi presidency continued by Italian presidency. Indonesia will, uh, uh, Indonesia presidency will uh, continue the excellent work of Saudi and Italian presidency to make cross-border payments a priority. I'm thanking to DG uh, Fahad Odosari of Saudi Arabian Monetary Authorities and also DG Piero uh, Cipollone of the Bank of Italy uh, to support for Indonesian uh, presidency uh, mostly in the topic of the uh, payment system. Uh, we broadly, Indonesia broadly support all 19 building blocks of the G20 roadmap for enhancing cross-border payments, which is being developed by the Financial Stability Board, FSB, in coordination with the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, CPMI, and other relevant international organizations and standard-setting bodies. Indonesian presidency will work closely uh, with members and international organizations to foster effort and action that I think uh, is necessary in order to implement the agreed changes that have been set for the roadmap, in particular, in interlinking of payment system for cross-border payments. One of these necessary changes is central banks must improve their payment system infrastructure by leveraging on digital technology and innovation. The emergence of fast payments is the embodiment of the enhancement carried out by the central banks. Currently, various countries, many countries, have or are developing fast payments within their respective countries. In the future, I think the development of fast payments should to be taken to the next level, namely cross-border. Singapore, I believe, is one of the pioneers in fast payment in the region. Indonesia learned a lot from uh, Singapore experience. Uh, we just launched our uh, Bank Indonesia FAST, BI FAST, a real-time 24-7 retail payment system infrastructure. Uh, the BI FAST payment system was on target to be fully operating in the second week of December with the initial step aimed at individual credit transfer service. Next, of course, uh, BI FAST services will also be expanded in further phases covering the service of the book about credit, direct debit, and request for payments. A theme for the step will include enhancement directed at cross-border linking with other fast payment system. I think this is uh, already uh, have initiated by the MIS in, with uh, some central banks in the region. I think uh, Bank Indonesia will then uh, join uh, with the interlinking in the region. Nevertheless, in developing the capability of, uh, <coughs> of the BI pass, we will always put forward the principle of efficiency, effectiveness, innovation, competition, inclusivity, security, and risk mitigation. I will now touch a little bit on the CBDC. 
as already uh, DG Piero uh, Cipolloni uh, mentioned. CBDC that uh, are currently being developed by various countries can also accelerate the creation of cross-border payments that are safe, fast, inexpensive, and inclusive. While CBDC development is initially driven by domestic circumstances, it has enormous potential for addressing challenges and frictions of cost, speed, access, and transparency on cross-border payments. There are emerged thinking of option for access to and intermaking of CBDCs that could improve cross-border payments, covering different CBDC designs, access, interlinkage options, including interoperability with non-CBDC payments arrangement. With certain models of the cross-border CBDC interlinking, such as an enhanced compatibility or shared technical interface, domestic CBDC can be supported both by existing payment system infrastructure and existing payment system technology. So can be interoperable between different platforms. Then again, in our eagerness to live with a such big step, we should not rushing to move forward without understanding and mitigate the potential risk. Building on the progress of the Italian presidency, Indonesia will focus on the building blocks number 19 of the cross-border payments roadmap, which is stock take of the CBDC. G20 should build a strong understanding of the international macro-financial implication of the CBDC. The central bank should not compromise monetary and financial stability when issuing a CBDC. The design and arrangement of CBDC should therefore be capable of mitigating risk and unintended consequences so that CBDC can subsequently enable a low friction environment so that inducing greater payments and financial flows, including cross borders. In this regard, use of the CBDC should be clearly complemented with the adequate safeguards, which may need careful consideration and extensive dialogue among G20 members. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we have much to look forward to in the Indonesian G20 presidency. A big thank you to our three deputy governors. We will now invite Mr. Luca Archero, head of the Money and Financial Market Division of Banca d'Italia's Market and Payment Systems Oversight Directorate, to set the foundation for the rest of the program uh, with an overview of the various payment interlinkage models. Luca, over to you, please. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Many thanks, Joe, for introducing me to the webinar participants. And good uh, morning, uh, afternoon, or evening to everybody. Before I begin, I would like to tell you that my presentation is based on a, with a forthcoming paper with uh, Giuseppe Marino, Filippo Pasqualone, and uh, Raffaele Tattaglia Polcini, who are all colleagues of mine here at the Bank of Italy. I wish to thank all of them for their uh, precious suggestions and support in preparing these slides. Now, to jump into my presentation, uh, let me stress one th once again that compared with domestic transactions, cross-border payments remain slow, costly, opaque, and less inclusive. This is why, because cross-border payments entails a high degree of complexity due to the many different parties involved in the transaction chain, the plurality of use cases and the underlying arrangements, the divergence in regulation and technical standards. Last but not least, conversion from one currency to another currency is often far from being an easy issue to be dealt with. As already mentioned by Mr. Canari in his opening remark, cross-border transactions are increasingly important for the world economy due to the growth of in international trade, world tourism, and migratory phenomena. Cross-border remittances represent maybe the largest type of person-to-person -person retail payments, and they represent a significant source for many citizens in several jurisdictions. So advances in these fields are strictly needed. 
we know that cross-border payments are typically settled via four channels. Um, we do not have comprehensive data on cross-border payment traffic, but making a, a best guess, we can argue that in terms of volume, correspondent banking is arguably the main channel for settling uh, uh, cross-border payments. Next, uh, also closed the loop systems are widely used. They are in house transfer or intergroup transfer, uh, the trans where the transactions is originated and completed on us on the account of uh, the same payment service providers, which bridge between the two jurisdictions. A third channel, the one we focus on today, are payment infrastructures, either uh, through interlinking uh, across domestic systems or via regional or international cross-border platforms. Finally, we have the peer-to-peer -peer -peer solutions that enable, enables the payer to send payments directly to the payee without the intermediation, the intermediation of a uh, payment service providers. Uh, it is uh, reported that payment systems the payment infrastructure are uh, not uh, very widely used uh, still for uh, settlement of cross-border payments. This is uh, reported also by Beck Faruqi and Shiramaki in uh, their recent paper uh, on the BIS quarterly review. Despite this, a significant, significant contribution to the announcement of cross-border payments uh, can come from uh, payment systems that are already the backbone of financial systems at the domestic level. In fact, their role is fully in the cross-border payment space, is fully acknowledged by the G20 roadmap that devoted two out of 19 building blocks to the payment infrastructures, namely the 13 to the interlinking and the 17 to the central platform. Despite their uh, still uh, limited usage, um, payment systems are uh, fundamental for uh, several reasons. First, the settlement of transactions in payment system uh, as a rule take place in uh, legal tender, in central bank money, which is the only settlement that is uh, risk-free and ensures finality of transactions. And this is fundamental for financial stability and uh, purposes. The payment system are characterized by a wide access due to the open, fair, and non-discriminatory access rules that allows a good, high degree competitions uh, within the financial system in providing payment services. Finally, the existence of a long established oversight regime have contributed to the financial and operational soundness of such systems in line with well-defined international standard. All these factors, but not only these factors, explain why we, we do concentrate on uh, payment infrastructures for the goals of the G2020 roadmap. Let me now focus on, on interlinking and uh, start with a, a definitions. An interlinking is, uh, can be regarded as a set of contractual agreements, also, including also technical and operational component uh, that uh, aims at enabling transaction among uh, intermediaries uh, from different jurisdictions without uh, requiring these intermediaries to participate uh, in uh, the two payment system uh, at the same times. Uh, the exchange of information uh, necessary to complete successfully a cross-border transactions between the interlinking systems take place either via international financial messaging networks or through dedicated messaging channel. Uh, I don't want to enter part into the detail in, in technical details, but I would like to, on, to add that um, this exchange can be facilitated by application programming interfaces, the APIs, other technical interfaces, common message formats, or via translation layer between different uh, domestic uh, dialect.
as already stressed by um, the deputy governors or, and Mr. Canari and others in their opening remarks, there is a strong rationale to interlink fast payment systems that are the system that allows the execution of payments within a few seconds. First of all, they are open 20 hours per day, seven days per week, all the years. There are no bank holiday. So they can, can overcome one of the major frictions in executing cross-border systems. That is the lack of alignment in operating hours of RTGS systems due to the different time zones. In addition, fast payment systems are uh, nearly brand new. So they are often based on the latest data and the message formats. Uh, and thus, they benefit from the harmonization effort produced at the international level. They are uh, they rely uh, often rely already rely on the ISO 20 or 20, uh, 22 uh, standards. Finally, fast payment systems are fast. This means that in few seconds the payments are finally transferred from the originator account to the beneficiary account, also in the cross-border space. Uh, this uh, brings a, a great, great utility for end users, but offers also other potential advantages. I will we'll come back on this later on in my presentation. Now, let's turn to two fundamental dimensions in interlinkings. That are uh, uh, there are several relevant dimensions when we talk about interlinkings. But for the purposes of my presentation, I want to elaborate on, on the following two. The first one is the operational type dimension, what I call the operational time dimension, that is the way the, the systems uh, interconnect. Uh, two broad families can be identified for the sake of simplicity. Those uh, where the interlinking occurs on a bilateral basis and those uh, based on multilateral arrangements. Single access point model and direct link are both bilateral links. They connect mutually two jurisdictions uh, per times. In other model, other arrangements allows the uh, contemporaneous interlinking on several systems. Uh, this typically takes place via the hub and spoke model, where a central platform, the hub, simultaneously links several domestic systems, the spoke. The last type uh, presented in these slides are the uh, centralized platforms. Centralized platforms, uh, to be honest, are not interlinking strict to census because they do not interlink in domestic systems. They replace them, allowing participants from different jurisdictions to hold an account on the same platform. But they are relevant for the uh, purpose of this presentation. There are another way, other ways to, to link bilateral, multi, on a multilateral basis systems through a, a, net of, uh, a net of bilateral direct links. Um, there is uh, a stylized model, sometimes referred as a spaghetti model, at least in the Euro system uh, jargon, that is a multilateral arrangement where all the systems participating in the arrangements are mutually linked. It is apparent that uh, linking together a larger number, an increasingly large number of systems through a net of bilateral linkages entails an exponentially growing complexity as the number of the involved uh, links increase. Uh, uh, increase. This make uh, very difficult, um, challenging, this make challenging from an operational perspective to uh, implement a uh, uh, spaghetti model on a very large scale. A second way to create a multilateral arrangements through uh, direct links is through the so-called related links. This is 
that are systems connected to a chain of a two or more direct bilateral links. Um, obviously, the extreme links of the chains, the extremes, the, um, the systems that lies at the uh, uh, extreme of the chains are more and more distant as the number of systems included in the arrangement increases. Uh, the other relevant dimension I want to focus on is the one related to the FX conversions. Uh, that is the point in the paint chain where the currency conversion takes place. Uh, the, um, once again, we can group this in, the interlinking arrangements into families. The arrangement that provides an FX conversion service from the currency of the originator to the currency of the beneficiary and those not. Uh, belongs to the first class, uh, the class that provide the conversion services, uh, the cross-currency systems where the uh, payers, uh, the bank of the payers and the banks of the payee are debited and credited in their respective currencies. An FX conversion takes place at some, in the interbank space, in the, arrange, in the arrangement space, through a settlement of a foreign exchange transactions. Uh, conversely, single and multi-currency settlement model um, rely uh, on a single uh, on a currency as a settlement currency that can be the one, one of the jurisdiction participating in the arrangements or a third currency, sometimes an international uh, reserve currency chosen because uh, it's liquidity or it's uh, reduced the volatility. FX conversion in this case is executed outside the arrangements. Um, the banks uh, of the payers and the banks of P are either debited or credited in their uh, uh, domestic car, in the in the in the third currencies, but model have uh, pros and cons. To be quick, uh, we can say that um, with, when uh, the arrangement are provided, when the FX conversion are provided within the arrangements, uh, there is um, the transaction is uh, faster and uh, uh, arguably more transparent for the users. This is more complex to be revitalized on the other ends. And there are and there can be high liquidity costs for less traded currencies, according to the way the arrangement is built. On the other end, the other one uh, can be uh, deemed to be less efficient in terms of uh, speed of the end-to-end -end execution of the payments, less transparent for the users, because the um, the conversion takes place after the uh, outside arrangement after the payment is uh, received uh, by the uh, beneficiary PSP. Here you can find a mapping of some existing perspective and uh, proof, of com proof of concepts against these two dimensions. Uh, I want to beg uh, your pardon for excluding arrangements across the world. Um, this is not intended to be a comprehensive recollection of interlinking arrangements. However, I deem that uh, it can uh, provide some useful insights for uh, our uh, overview. Uh, as you can see on the x-axis, uh, I represented the two dimensions of the FX conversions, the two classes of uh, FX conversions, and on the y-axis, the two axes of uh, the operational types. As you can see, the arrangements, the interlinking arrangements tend to aggregate into well-defined clusters. More precisely, bilateral interlinkings to be associated with FX conversion within the arrangements. Multilateral interlinkings instead tend to be associated with FX conversion provided outside the arrangements. Um, uh, to my mind, this polarization appears to be saying that while a global net of bilateral link among the existing systems uh, could be operationally challenging, centralized solutions are likely to incur in difficulties in delivering a quality of services in terms of FX conversion 
comparable to that provided by tailored bilateral arrangements, at least on certain corridors uh, that are uh, pairs of jurisdiction uh, involved in a payment, cross-border payment transactions. Uh, this uh, is explained this, um, because uh, of liquidity cost associated to FX volatility of less traded currencies and Okay, so what we can infer from from uh, this uh, from the previous uh, mapping, uh, we have seen that generally centralized platform do not allow for uh, FX conversions, which is which has to be performed at side arrangements. This means this can mean that the players from jurisdictions with liquid currencies and large reciprocal flows could have an incentive and had, have had, had, uh, already had an incentive to set up bilateral links ensuring FX conversion because this uh, solution uh, deliver a greater utility to the users. Uh, this will deprive the global, a global potential global multilateral solutions connecting uh, all the jurisdiction across the world from its most profitable corridors. Uh, it is uh, like the cream scheming uh, in, uh, in, the, in the business space. Therefore, could recovery could severely impacted from uh, this cream scheming practices. Moreover, we, we need to take into account that some corridors uh, arguably those uh, more attractive uh, in terms of uh, number of payments are already served by bilateral links with FX conversion services embedded. Disconnected such links uh, would imply that some communities could be worse off in uh, comparison with the current situations. And uh, this is a very sensitive uh, issue. So, uh, we can uh, we can think that cold multilateral solutions uh, uh, could uh, require public good factors to to serve the needs of uh, some, some specific needs in uh, for, uh, in case of uncollective uh, uh, uncollective needs uh, uh, being satisfied. Let me now elaborate on possible way forwards. A first reflection is on the possibility of using a different FX approach. Um, I already mentioned that the cross currency volatilities and liquidity is a pain point, a pain point for FX conversions because of uh, high volatility imposes high liquidity costs. Accordingly, we could think to use a currency basket because averaging through different exchange rates smooths volatility. Uh, moreover, a basket could be engineered on purposes, depending, for example, on the geographical scope of the platform. A potential candidate for this role could be the um, special drawing rights, the international SDR, the international reserve assets created by the IMF in 1969 and based on a basket of five major currencies. However, concrete use of the SDR as a global means of payments would require uh, to overcome some uh, intrinsic limitation, legal limitation of because, as clearly stated by the IMF, the um, SDR is uh, neither a currency nor a claim on the IMF. Other solution based on uh, CDBC, CBDC are, are still to, to, to be fully explored. Uh, so uh, we we should to try to, uh, in my view, to make the best from my from uh, the existing um, leveraging uh, on existing domestic infrastructures and existing interlinking solution will ensure two goals. First, that no one be worse off in comparison with today's situations. Second, that losses from not amortized investments. 
uh, uh, will be avoided. Accordingly, uh, in my view, a global uh, payment network could be built, be built around a mix of regional platforms connected via bilateral links or multilateral apps and, and spoke solutions, and also red links linking some domestic systems to the global net, to a node of the global net. Each link could provide or not the for the FX conversion mechanism according to the specific needs and uh, limitations of uh, each uh, uh, corridors. Um, something like that. Uh, I, 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 I know that this is not uh, like a piece of art by Rembrandt or, or Michelangelo, but hopefully I, I, it is enough to, to convey the idea. Uh, uh, this we have uh, regional platforms, domestic systems connected by a variety of solutions. It is apparent that uh, um, fast payment systems are sort of preconditions for such a, a model to work effectively. Uh, because uh, uh, for a real, real link to, to serve the purposes of the uh, end users, it is necessary that uh, payments are settled in few seconds. So also in the uh, far, far, uh, uh, more distant nodes from the, 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 the global network, from the core of the network, the payments can be uh, executed in uh, in, uh, a in a few seconds or minutes. Let me now uh, conclude um, that uh, remarking that uh, an enabler of uh, uh, such solutions is the ability of current and prospective domestic systems and regional platform to interlink each other according to several models. In this way, uh, let me quote the example of TIPS. TIPS is the Eurosystem platform uh, managed by, operated by the Bank of Italy on behalf of the Eurosystem for the settlement, created for the settlement of instant payment in Euro. Uh, TIPS, first of all, is designed as a multi-currency platform and therefore it is uh, capable to processing other currencies uh, other than Euro. Uh, uh, tips could uh, um, allow settlement cross currency settlement of payments uh, in uh, several models. It can host currencies in uh, its uh, platforms, so it can uh, host uh, do, uh, uh, foreign uh, communities in its platform and uh, allows for a cross currency settlement um, or a multi currency settlement. Um, tips can link to other technical platform via either direct links, as uh, it was the case uh, of the POC with uh, Buna uh, recently uh, performed, or uh, through uh, central hubs, uh, uh, as in the uh, ecosystem of, of, uh, of Nexus. Therefore, solution like tips, flex should, flexible solution like tips, appears well suited to for to be functional for an effect uh, to be an effective node of a global payment network um, this this conclude uh, uh, my presentation and um, thank you for for the attention of all the participants and uh, joe the floor is yours thank you very much Thank you so much, Luca. I think you have given us a lot to think about and uh, the issues were very well enunciated. I'd just like to remind uh, the audience that our Q&A box is open. You can put in your questions there. Uh, now, if there are specific questions for the presenter, uh, we, if we have time, we'll take them after the, pre the presentation. Now, for general questions, we will take them at the general discussion. Do make use of the Q&A box. Now, let's take a more detailed look at the initiatives to link fast payment systems across borders. First up, we have a presentation on the ongoing work to link TIPS and BUNA. I'm pleased to invite uh, Mr. Giancarlo Esposito, Head of Payments, 
Cash Management and Open Banking at Banca Intesa, Sao Paulo. And Mr. Faisal Alhijawi, Chief of Strategy of Buna, to share more with us on this ambitious undertaking. I understand that uh, Faisal will go first. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. If you don't mind just giving me sharing rights so ca I can share my presentation. No worries. I think Camilla will give you sharing rights in a moment. Uh, should be okay now. Did you receive yes. the message? Okay. Thank you. Just confirming if you can see my screen. Yes, can you go full screen? Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Again, thank you very much uh, for uh, colleagues in uh, Bank of Italia and uh, Monetary Authority of uh, Singapore uh, for uh, hosting us today and uh, for this uh, great opportunity. Um, this is to share with you uh, some of the key findings and the overall experience uh, we had uh, linking or interlinking uh, TIPS uh, payment system with Buna payment system with the great participation of uh, Intesa San Paolo Bank and uh, Jordan Ahli Bank. Um, I believe colleagues already covered a lot about uh, the G20 roadmap. Uh, this experiment has been along the same lines, uh, particularly blocks 13 and 17 about interlinking payment systems in order to solve the, 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 the four uh, main uh, frictions in cross-border payments, cost, speed, uh, transparency and uh, access. Uh, just uh, like a, a little bit about Buna. So Buna is uh, an Arab word for infrastructure. So it's uh, it's the centralized infrastructure uh, or payment infrastructure system for the uh, Arab world, uh, operated by uh, the Arab Regional Payment Clearing and Settlement Organization (ARP CSO), which is owned by the Arab Monetary Fund, uh, and the Arab Monetary Fund in turn is, is owned by the uh, Arab states represented in, in their finance ministries and uh, central banks. Um, so this is an opportunity also to thank uh, all the Arab states uh, and, and the central banks for the continuous support uh, for the Bona initiative. Uh, so this experiment, uh, basically, we, we joined hands with, uh, with Banca d'Italia to, to uh, create a proof of concept uh, with their uh, interlinking between uh, totally separate instant payment systems can take uh, place and what are the key considerations and uh, um, uh, challenges. Um, obviously, we, we kept in mind that this uh, uh, has to be, by nature, it's a cross-border, uh, by nature, it's uh, a cross-platform, but also uh, we wanted it to be cross-currency to make sure that uh, we can uh, uh, experiment uh, the maximum number of aspects. Uh, just as a, as a quick reminder uh, or, or refresher about uh, the main characteristics of a typical instant payment system, uh, obviously you would expect an IPS or IPN or a fast payment system as terminologies vary from, from country to another, uh, basically to, uh, to deliver funds and, and uh, within seconds. Uh, to be 24 by 7 by 365 days uh, available. Um, obviously, uh, they can be agnostic, low volume, high volume. In some uh, particular markets, they are more towards uh, low volume, like uh, uh, P2P, for example. End-to-end uh, -end tracking is, is a key, and um, usually uh, instant payment systems also are diverse in terms of the different use cases and sub-use cases. So you can do a credit transfer, you can request for a payment, uh, you can send to an, an, an alias like a nickname or a, or a mobile number. So these are the, the, the uh, typical characteristics of, of an instant payment system. If we take tips and, and, and Buna, uh, a typical flow will look like uh, this. Uh, there is an originating bank and a receiving bank with the, with the IPS infrastructure in the middle. So the first step would be to uh, uh, instruct the payment uh, by the originating bank. The uh, IPS infrastructure validates that payment. If all checks uh, uh, go successful, the payment gets forwarded to the uh, receiving institution. The receiving institution confirms back, and usually end-to-end -end confirmation is a key for a success of an IPS system. Um, if that confirmation is received successfully by the IPS infrastructure, it uh, uh, settles the payment and confirms that settlement back to the uh, 
uh, to the payment originator or the uh, originating uh, bank. Now, let's put this into a cross-border uh, context, and this is was the uh, main uh, objective of this uh, experiment. You will get the uh, following uh, characteristics. Obviously, um, we we went with a remittance use case because um, if we, if we look at the landscape today, remittances probably are the uh, uh, most visible and, uh, and clear uh, use case that is impacted by the four fractions of, of cross-border payments. And uh, cost comes obviously as uh, number one, as we know. Uh, it has the highest cost compared to the other types of payment. So we wanted to uh, uh, give that a priority in our experiment. Uh, instant delivery uh, cross-currency. So we did the experiment uh, from a uh, European region from Italy to Abuna region, Jordan, uh, with the uh, participation of two leading banks, Intesa San Paolo and uh, Jordan Ali Bank. Uh, obviously, due to the nature of both systems, and also uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that uh, the, the, the POC uh, comply with the global trends, we made sure that ISO 2022 uh, is the uh, the way to uh, conduct the messaging between the, the systems. We uh, conducted it in terms of connectivity over the SWIFT network, particularly the AGI uh, infrastructure for both connectivity and security. Uh, and in terms of the final outcome that we needed from this uh, experiment, uh, obviously is the um, actual experiment findings, which will be also followed and documented and shared in a, in a form of an academic uh, paper. Uh, probably to shed a little light also on the geographical side of, of Buna. So Buna is operating in 14 uh, Arab markets. We picked Jordan for, uh, for, for this experiment for different reasons. Number one, uh, Jordan, uh, one of the uh, countries that that uh, that has a number of banks actively participating in Buna, Jordan Ahli Bank uh, is a leading uh, Jordan-based bank, uh, uh, especially in the retail space, and was among the, the very first who, who launched the service with Buna. Jordan, as a market itself, if we look at it uh, macroeconomically, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, one of the key uh, remittance markets, more than $5 billion uh, remittance uh, market comes uh, between third and fourth uh, on, at, uh, at an Arab region uh, level. Um, and it has payments in both directions. So there are almost a million Jordanian expats living abroad and also more than a million expats living in Jordan. So there is a, a pretty much 50-50 uh, volume breakdown in terms of inward and outward uh, cross-border payments. So all these elements together made perfect sense uh, for that choice for the proof of concept. Now on the on the uh, POC itself, uh, if we look at the uh, characteristics that exp explained by colleagues from Banca d'Italia earlier uh, about interlinking, we see that uh, this POC fits uh, most, if not all. Uh, of those. Uh, so we are talking about two different regions, two different currencies, two different platforms, and also two commercial banks that are participating in two different systems without any uh, existing uh, contractual or, or, or technical uh, relationship uh, between them. And then comes in the interoperability layer, which is basically the work that TIPS and uh, BUNA uh, did together. So uh, the, the, the scope was to experiment a number of remittance uh, payments in, that will originate in euro and will be uh, fulfilled in uh, Jordanian dinar. Uh, we, uh, as Buna and TIPS, we, we built this uh, middle layer that will look after the uh, interoperability, translation of message format, uh, settlement of funds in both uh, systems, um, this is the harmonization uh, part, basically. We try to uh, find and build uh, the, 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 the harmonization that is needed for these two uh, foreign payment systems to understand each other and interlink uh, with each other. Of course, thanks to uh, the expertise and the support of SWIFT, uh, who played a, a key role in the uh, success of this uh, POC. 
a little bit more details about uh, the flow. So uh, basically, as you can see from, from this diagram, you have the TIPS uh, side, the European side, which is in Tessa San Paolo Bank as an originating institution connected to the TIPS instant payment system using the usual rails, using the usual standard, using the usual rules. That part is business as usual, was not uh, touched in this experiment, and that's a key uh, in order to, to, to guarantee realistic uh, uh, outcome from this POC. Similarly, if you look at the, at the other side, the Buna side, the, the Arab region side, that is Ahli, Jordan Ahli Bank connected to uh, Buna system uh, using as well uh, the same rails, the usual rails, the business as usual arrangement that is between uh, Buna and its uh, participants with absolute no existing relationship between uh, both uh, banks. In the middle, the, the, the interoperability heavy lifting was basically uh, conducted by, by Buna and uh, TIPS, where um, we, as I mentioned, we, we created this uh, harmonization and there are different options here that, that have been discussed. Obviously, uh, the, the one we landed on is what we call it the uh, cross participation model where we simulated uh, an, an, an entity uh, that basically it's a, a foreign exchange uh, PSP uh, that is participant in both systems that will be responsible to do the message translation as each system uh, while they are both uh, on, on ISO 2022, but they are applying a different uh, flavors or, or, or dialects of, of the protocol. Uh, to, to handle the uh, FX conversion from uh, Euro to Jordanian dinar, and as well, of course, to by, by, by sheer uh, uh, nature of, of, of being uh, uh, an entity in the middle will also uh, be responsible for the actual settlement of the, of, of the funds. Um, four payments uh, have been initiated uh, successfully by Intesa Sao Paulo using the PAX-8 uh, format. Uh, went through the, the TIPS, BUNA, uh, interoperability layer all the way to the end to Jordan Ahli Bank. Confirmed back successfully with the PAX-002 response as well. And uh, the average was uh, less than 20 seconds. The average was around 14.75 uh, uh, seconds. Uh, which is, uh, we believe, is, is an impressive uh, uh, outcome. Um, we ideally we wanted, of course, to to, to have a real entity in the, in the middle uh, doing this cross cross participation uh, harmonization. But because the experiment itself uh, uh, was very tight in terms of timeline, uh, which basically we, we we have done this work in in, in few weeks, uh, we had to simulate that role. But uh, all the findings and uh, the, uh, the information that are documented in the academic article will pave a great ground for, for any uh, entities in the future. And in fact, there are several entities who heard about this experiment and expressed high interest to, to play uh, such a role. Um, moving to, to the key conclusions uh, of this uh, experiment, uh, technically, uh, this put the G20 uh, building blocks 13 and 17 in action and has proven that interlinking uh, cross-currency, cross-border, cross-platform instant payments uh, is uh, possible. And uh, for the record, this was also conducted in the testing environment. Uh, so probably if you look at uh, live production environments, uh, there could be even uh, better uh, results to, to, to be uh, uh, taking place. Uh, so that that that, that uh, technical fact uh, uh, proves that there is a great potential for for such opportunities and interlinking for providing better and and lower cost uh, services. Um, the harmonization took place through the cross participation model with the, as I mentioned with an entity in the middle, and uh, this has uh, lots of advantages uh, where basically the heavy lifting is performed by 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 that layer. Uh, but this doesn't mean that it is the only model. There could be also other models uh, where uh, both uh, instant payment systems uh, natively interact uh, with, with each other. So that's again 
subject to further experiments in the in the, in the future. Um, obviously, there are key considerations, and some of the, some of those uh, already uh, were uh, touched upon by my colleagues in the previous sessions. The, the the foreign exchange element is obviously uh, is a key because we are talking about 24 by 7 service uh, cross border cross currency uh, so it, it needs to be carefully looked at uh, in terms of choice of currencies uh, in terms of choice of entities uh, because any delay uh, in the uh, fx leg of that transaction can hinder the whole transaction we talk about uh, instant payment in seconds, end to end. So there is no room for queuing. Uh, there is no room for uh, exceeding the, 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 the time out uh, period that, that are typically available in all instant payment system. So that's that's a key area to, uh, to, to look at. And probably maybe this is one of the advantages of having that uh, cross participation model for, for harmonization, where there is a well established entity or entities, it doesn't have to be one, uh, that can have accounts in both systems in multiple currencies and, and be able to provide the, the, the cross currency conversion 24 uh, by 7. Uh, last but not least, obviously, uh, uh, some operational and compliance uh, risks that need to be uh, taken into account. Different jurisdictions, different AML requirements, uh, different compliance uh, requirements. Uh, this is uh, something that also need to be to be uh, considered the type of data that need to travel uh, with the transaction in order to guarantee the compliance and, and minimum intervention. Uh, all these and more uh, elaborated uh, elements, uh, you will be able to see it in the uh, upcoming academic article, which will document this um, experiment in detail. Obviously, the journey doesn't stop here. There are so many happenings in this space, uh, as, as you know. Uh, so from Buna side, we will continue to build bridges uh, around the interoperability with other payment systems, uh, both on the east and the west side of, of the Arab region, uh, supporting the growth of the Arab region and supporting the, uh, uh, the, the, the key ties in terms of uh, uh, relationships and remittances. Uh, obviously, special focus also on interlinking uh, instant payment systems within the, the, the Arab region, and uh, lots of these conversations are started to, to materialize. Similarly, obviously, from TEP's side, the several initiatives are, uh, are, are happening. Uh, the, the, the Swedish Corona, as an example, uh, on, on the tie-up with the Rex Bank, uh, something very interesting to, to keep an eye on. And uh, last but not least, We've all uh, seen the, the, the BIS uh, uh, blueprint, and I think colleagues about uh, from uh, BIS Innovation Hub will be talking in more details later. Uh, uh, we are also uh, in discussion with them. We hosted them in our workshops, and uh, we look forward as well to uh, explore that uh, path with them. So that's about the uh, TIPS uh, Buna experiment. Uh, thank you again, and a special, a special thanks to our participants in, in TESA San Paolo from the TIPS side and uh, Jordan Ahli Bank from the, from the Buna side uh, on, on their support. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Faisal. And uh, Giancarlo, you have the floor next. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me today. And uh, um, I hope that you are uh, able to see my, my desktop, my, my presentation. Just go for screen. Perfect. Thank you. OK. OK. Thank you very much. Um, so just a few, few, few words about uh, Intesa San Paolo. Uh, we are uh, the, uh, the, the biggest Italian bank. We are leading uh, uh, all the um, segments with more than 22% in customer deposits and 21 in customer loans. We have uh, uh, more than uh, 4,700 branch, branches uh, all over Italy with more than uh, 13 uh, million and a half. As well as we are also a strategic presence uh, uh, worldwide with uh, approximately 1,000 branches and uh, more than uh, 7 million customers, including commercial banking subsidiaries in 12 countries uh, in Central and Eastern uh, Europe and uh, Middle East and North Africa. 
um, just a quick look of our international network. So we are uh, present across 25 countries serving corporate customers, uh, four, four corporate uh, banks, 14 international branches, four corporate hub, and 11 representative uh, offices. Um, this is just to introduce why uh, in international payments are uh, so important in our strategy and why we uh, decided to uh, join uh, this, um, this initiative of interlinking uh, um, payment systems. Uh, just a quick overlook of what we have done in the instant payments uh, so far. We, we launched uh, SCT INST in Europe uh, in November 2017. We were just one of the first four banks to, to launch the, uh, to adhere to the new schema. Uh, starting from today also, we are uh, formally and in production applied also to, to tips like uh, um, like ACH, and uh, we are now performing uh, more than 10% of uh, uh, the total amount of credit transfer as SET Inst. Uh, and, you, and, and if you uh, consider just the retail part, this um, this amount is uh, higher, is, uh, is is much more higher than 10%. Um, Looking to uh, the cross-border payment scenario, we know that it's being hit by structural changes nowadays. Uh, the new innovative and regressive competitors are coming. The technology is uh, improving and we are uh, facing uh, new opportunities. New use cases and customer habits are emerging uh, due to the pandemic, but not only. We have seen also uh, habits that are um, Growing, uh, that were growing also before the pandemic, and is uh, shifting to uh, real time uh, for everything, and also, of course, an increasing, increasing uh, regulatory pressure. Um, this scenario uh, is um, is uh, the, the very interesting presentation uh, made by uh, Mr. Acero before was uh, presenting. Um, we are addressing now the uh, cross-border payments uh, through the traditional, let me say, traditional uh, correspondent banking model. Um, at the moment, we, have see, we are seeing uh, different forces that are coming to uh, this table. Uh, we see international car networks that are trying to exploit their international presence in order to uh, move from card only payments also to account accounts. Uh, we, see, we are seeing also uh, payment platforms, global banks that are trying to offer a solution that may um, also uh, substitute what, what are the existing uh, correspondent banking model for, uh, for banks, uh, as well as we have uh, GAFAs and a lot of new fintechs uh, that are uh, coming to the to to to, to this new uh, new not, not not new but this new business, and of, of course as we've seen also in uh, in previous uh, uh, speeches we have seen also the digital currencies as one of the most uh, interesting uh, solution that are uh, that, that may be uh, connected to the cross border payments. But we have seen different. Uh, we, we have we have um, conducted several studies internally. At, at the end of the day, we have seen that there is, uh, as, as often comes, there is no crystal ball at the moment. So there are two. The scenario seems to be very, very various, uncertain, and so uh, we believe that uh, we are we, we are in the time that. Uh, uh, we should pursue uh, different verticals, different solution in order to uh, be able to offer what we have seen before should be the, the main goal of the cross-border payment system of tomorrow, uh, where the payments could be faster, uh, cheaper, more transparent, and of course, uh, more uh, inclusive. So we were very, very happy to, to join BUNA uh, to uh, perform this, um, this POC. 
um, uh, it, it was possible thanks to, to the fact that both TIPS and Luna uh, were supporting EXML uh, messages complying with the ISO 2022 2022 uh, standard. Um, there were, there were uh, some gaps, of course, between the two structures, but uh, interoperability was uh, still possible um, just dis without distorting the messages, just converting them. Um, also, it was uh, very helpful uh, to, uh, to have the possibility to, to count on the flexibility of the TIPS infra infrastructure. Uh, since TIPS was conceived from the beginning as a multi-currency platform, and uh, which has shown also thanks with this POC to have high versatility and applicability. We believe uh, finally that uh, um, this uh, POC uh, could be considered just as the first experiment of a multi-corridor layer. We could enhance cross-border immediate payments all over the world, uh, moving transactional services to a real-time world where nowadays we are facing the paradox with goods that are real, sometimes move faster than money that is digital. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giancarlo, as well as Faisal for the earlier presentation. We will now shift our focus to Asia. Uh, let's take a look at the interlinking of fast payment systems of Singapore and Thailand. Uh, PayNow Prompt Pay was the world's first linkage of two national real-time payment systems and my team had the privilege of working with uh, Mr. Dennis Lau, Head Commercial Designated Payment Systems at Banking Computing Services Singapore. Uh, he will share with us how this linkage was conceptualized and developed and the challenges that both countries overcame to launch this world's first. Dennis, over to you, please. Thank you, Joe. Um, everyone can see the screen just to just to confirm that. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Banker the Italia, as well as the Monetary Authority of Singapore for the invitation to present um, our cross-border journey interlinking from pay and pay now. Um, so just to start off, um, both countries' vision for this was to enhance on the customer's convenience for cross-border payments and remittance to switch to switch order, um, which is fast, secure, and cost-effective. Um, so our mission statement at that point in time was to do a pilot launch with payments and remittance services. And we managed to do this in April, 2021 with the strong support of the regulators as well as the domestic uh, payments provider and the banks involved. So just to share from a guiding principles perspective, um, there were five of them that we have Followed. So the first one would be uh, promoting ASEAN payment connectivity. Um, so we had that in mind. And then we wanted to make sure that we are using open infrastructure as well as um, providing the interoperability to facilitate convenient and cost saving payments um, as well as remittance channels. Uh, on top of that, this would then encourage competition and innovate services. Uh, that leverage on this same infrastructure linkage. And we have to comply with the laws and regulations of each ju jurisdiction, including AML, CFT, risk management, consumer protection, etc. Um, with that, we establish a pilot project and the use cases for other linkages. And then we can reuse that same template for all our other uh, ASEAN countries. So. To start with that, we actually came up with a target operating model. Um, we managed to get banks who can represent Singapore, banks who can help to be pilots in the Thailand side. And we had three, DBS, OCBC, as well as UO, UOB. At the Thailand side, um, they've managed to get Bangkok Bank, Asikon Bank, Kron Thai Bank, and Stein Commercial Bank. And we also agreed on a available channels in terms of using the mobile app or internet banking. Um, the use case was to address a peer-to-peer, -peer, that being the first. And we wanted to make sure that having that transfer being made easy using a mobile phone number as a preferred proxy. So 
to mitigate any risk as well as managing the um, transfers. Um, any industry payments limit is at based on 25,000 baht. Um, from Singapore's perspective, it's, that's about 1,000 sing dollar. And the pricing commercials were then based on sending bank, quoting and executing bid. But otherwise, from a settlement model perspective, it's a many to one settlement. Um, one settlement bank for each currency at each country. And then it is consolidated outgoing payments based on local currency. So the payments notifications, which is a very key part of any real-time payment systems, uh, following current bank's practices. Basically, what it means is if I'm sending a money across to Thailand side, Thailand would then notify the receiver that the money has been received. But otherwise, um, we do not do any refund and returns. Those are not applicable. And we follow the existing bank practices for any recourse if needed. So a simplified flow of how a cross-border transaction flow, inclusive of the proxy, comes about. If you follow the red line, um, first, the Singapore participant having to send to the Thai participant would then do a lookup based on a Thai number. That would then be sent across um, to the country's um, relevant domestic player, uh, would then resolve that proxy, provide a lookup details, and then coming back to the Singapore participant. But otherwise, once that is approved, or rather once that is agreed on, understanding who we are sending to, and that final name, the bank would then send the initiating a funds transfer to the cross-border end. So the funds would then be taken as the blue lines, if you see here. Um, this would then be sent. Thailand side would then accept the fund, re fund transfer, return a confirmation of the acceptance, and that will come back to the Singapore end to give a confirmation. So just to share at the bottom here, this gives a flavor of what is that status, um, where is it being accepted, and how the transaction will appear in the settlement file. So as I shared earlier, we also look at how to handle in terms of the AML, CFT, because of the way Singapore does it, the way Thailand does it, they are different. Um, this is done at different layers. So from Singapore to Thailand, and if you notice, the Thai side actually does it a bit differently. They do it at the lookup area. At the Singapore end, we actually do it at the payment area. Similarly, for Thai to Singapore, Thailand would then send the information to us. They will do it just before sending that, that payment. And Singapore will only do it at the receiving part of the payment. Otherwise, from a legal and governance framework perspective, um, we have now gone into what we call the BAU or mature phase, where there's a joint oversight panel being set up. And the legal structure is where a multi-party agreement covering the operating rules, um, the joint governance matters, appointment of operators, as well as scheme and settlement rules. This is signed with the participating banks and the operator, where one of the participating banks is actually a settlement bank. So the operating rules would then cover the roles and responsibility of all the participants, the operator, the commercial terms, as well as the operational service level agreements and any dispute resolutions. Lastly, some key learnings from this implementation is the first one is understanding of use cases. Um, I like to use this term called same, same, but different. And what it means is this. Um, if you have understanding of how Thailand, um, what Thailand is using in terms of their system and the Singapore system, we are very similar. We use the same similar product, but yet the way we use it are slightly different. Um, so for example, in Thailand, um, they don't handle, they do more of what we call finality of payments. In Singapore, we do handle a slightly different use case, what we call technical timeouts, and that will give a slightly different um, processing 
uh, sorry, processing status. And that's why the need to understand use cases is important. Uh, alignment of that is important. Uh, the legal and regulation requirements, obviously you need to factor that timing needed for this difference. Um, both countries having slightly different laws, slightly different regulation requirements. You need to factor that in when you are starting to embark on this project. Uh, the third one is a constant and frequent engagement with key stakeholders. This helps because we had the um, regulators joining us in the engagements. We had the banks who are the key participants joining the engagement, having the discussion, uh, sitting at the table together to discuss brings us across the line easier. So that is important. Item four is more towards planning and scenario handling. Uh, after understanding the use cases, we needed to address all angles where possible on the paper um, to understand how we can handle where the breakage is based on the flow, what will happen, what are the different, what I call um, uh, reason code return, uh, exception handling, because real-time systems really depends on exception handling a lot. Lastly, testing, testing, and testing. Um, I can't stress this much. Uh, we are connecting two country system and having more testing wouldn't hurt. Thank you. Joe. Thank you so much, Dennis. Now we have covered two examples of bilateral faster payments linkages and our speakers have outlined a number of challenges that countries need to overcome in order to establish such linkages. Now let us uh, consider if a multilateral approach would help us achieve better scalability of cross-border linkages. We have with us today Mr. Andrew McCormack, the head of the Singapore Centre of the BIS Innovation Hub. Andrew is leading the charge on Project Nexus, which offers a comprehensive blueprint for countries to fully integrate their fast payment systems onto a single cross-border network. Andrew, take it away, please. Hi, Joe. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess I am to share my own slide. So just give me one second, please. No worries. We are doing very well for time. So yeah, no I'm a little all. bit. Uh, so let's see here. Yep. Um, now, do you see presentation mode or is it? Uh, uh, we see slides. You can head over to presentation. Uh, okay. Button. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Andrew McCormick. I'm the center head for the Innovation Hub uh, here in Singapore. And uh, you know, building on some of the prior presentations, um, what we've done recently is publish some work uh, entitled Project Nexus, which is all about a uh, potential multilateral uh, model to interconnect uh, fast payment systems. And uh, I'll say that, you know, certainly uh, you're welcome to uh, take notes, but we've published uh, quite a comprehensive suite of documentation on our project microsite, which is at nexus.bisih.org, excuse me, uh, or the bis.org website. And if you can find your way to the Innovation Hub pages, uh, that information is also there. Um, so again, our, 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 our simple view here is that instant payment systems are indeed the, the future and, and certainly in many countries have become the backbone for domestic account to account payments. Uh, and that interlinking them is, is it creates an opportunity space in the next frontier. Um, instant payment systems around the world, such as where I'm, I'm talking for obviously from Singapore uh, this evening. Um, you know, the fast payment system here has, has really become ubiquitous and, and well uh, adopted throughout the country. Uh, there are many other uh, instant payment systems around the world. I believe UPI in India is doing north of 4 billion transactions a month or something quite unbelievable. So uh, there's really a strong, strong uh, case for, you know, um, di digital payments based on instant payment systems. And that, uh, you know, that that's that's fairly clear at this point. Um, the, there are at least 60 countries and, and many more under development as we speak. Connecting instant payment systems is, we believe, um, the next frontier. 
And uh, certainly, uh, there are many ways to do that. But you know, again, these these systems have coherent risk models, uh, sound governance, and uh, and and a and a wide participation base of PSPs and banks. And so, uh, if we can divine a way to connect them bi bilaterally, as was just described, then we should also think about: is there a standard, a potential way to you know create a standard and interconnect things in a more multilateral way? Uh, some of the projects certainly that have been covered uh, already are, you know, Singapore, uh, Thailand, uh, the Singapore, India and Malaysia projects. There are others as well that are being, um, you know, they're rather behind, but certainly uh, in either research or pilot uh, pilot phases. Uh, we know, for example, TIPS uh, is, is working with Sweden on a, on a multi tenant environment that would eventually also become a kroner euro uh, infrastructure uh, and um, on, uh, we've also been made aware that um, the um, clearinghouse in the U.S. has done some work with EBA clearing uh, as well. So there's there's definitely a lot of I think interest in this space, and you know the benefits are clear, right? So um, you know to to get to offer a, a kind of a real time user experience uh, um, for cross border is is very attractive. Uh, something that has 24 by 7, 365 operations uh, based on instant payments infrastructure that is indeed possible. Um, this opens up, I think, uh, the possibility of lowering costs uh, for cross-border payments. Um, uh, as you know, at the very least, many of these systems are certainly based on more modern infrastructure and technology, which, which uh, so they're not saddled by technology debt per se. Um, there is uh, you know, a certain transparency that can be offered in these types of systems where all uh, users are, you know, can, be, can be granted uh, you know, all of the information they need in terms of transparency, in terms of fees, um, access, you know, when you, when you connect infrastructure, the way, um, the way we're thinking about doing, uh, we think that we can create a, a more competitive playing field for all the participants and allow for kind of more innovation to happen on top. And of course, safety and security is, is paramount in any payments infrastructure. And, and again, these domestic systems build on a strong uh, risk management and oversight frameworks. So it's a great uh, starting point. And, and I think a cross-border system could leverage all of these and, and be put in place uh, to, to, um, to create this, this new future universe. Um, the obstacles as have been touched on already are, are, are not uh, insignificant. Um, there certainly are bilateral linkages and, 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 and there, a lot of effort goes into creating those, but those really do expose kind of the, some of the issues, right? Data formats. Uh, different standards and, and mandatory fields in different in different messaging schemes, uh, processes and the sequence of payments, obviously scheme rules in terms of uh, you know well certainly even access to cross border for, for cross border uh, use cases to domestic domestic systems is in many places not not in place and obviously all of the uh, regulations and, and legal framework around liability disputes and, and data protection and even privacy can have to be grappled with. And, and then, you know, lastly, uh, there's, there's functional gaps. Not all, not all uh, instant payment systems uh, have the same capabilities, so to speak, or support the same capabilities. For example, the way proxy databases and aliases are used and the types of proxy uh, addresses that are in fact available, how they're resolved, um, uh, confirmation of payee, and some of the other things we'll talk about in, in, in further on in the presentation. So integration is indeed hard, and, uh, and we're under no illusion that, that trying to scale um, uh, bilateral connections into multilateral connections would, would be any easier. Uh, in fact, it will be harder. But of course, linking payment systems is uh, very much, payments are a network business. And, and obviously, as you connect, as you kind of think through the bilateral connections, it becomes very, very unscalable in terms of the, you know, the number of permutations and combinations. Uh, this introduces a lot of complexity, a lot of operational complexity at the very least. And, um, and really what we need to do is think through what a multilateral arrangement could look like in order to address this obvious complexity, and then also to create those network effects that, that payment systems really truly uh, rely on. So how might Nexus uh, actually address these issues and, and, and specifically, you know, how would Nexus propose to standardize the way and payment systems indeed uh, speak to each other. Um, first and foremost, it's 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 definitely built around a gateway construct, uh, much in the same way Prompt Pay and PayNow are, in that these gateways need to be deployed into the IPS environments and essentially operated by the instant payment system operators. 
but these gateways would have to be obviously intelligent enough to be aware of all of the other uh, endpoints on the network. Uh, so it's a Nexus is as designed right now, a very distributed system with a lot of intelligence baked into those gateways in terms of routing, in terms of interacting with FX providers and, and, and a variety of other flows that I'll get into shortly. Um, but once you have that multilateral network, um, you know, each each instant payment system, in theory, from a technology perspective, uh, would only have to integrate once, and then uh, you wouldn't have to re you know redo that connection with every other country. And so, in some way, it averages out some of this complexity, but obviously pushes a lot more of it to the edge where it has to be uh, resolved, and there has to be a lot of um, you know detailed design and, and thought put into exactly how to you know further design and refine this model and uh, roll it out. The key functions of Nexus, which I'll try to get into again in the presentation, are FX conversion. So the other obvious fact is domestic payment systems are single currency systems for the most part. Uh, even many regional payment systems like TIPS are obviously single currency euro in that case across many countries, uh, but indeed are not aware of or have the ability to translate or swap between two different currencies. So there has to be a capability obviously in this Nexus uh, blueprint to handle the FX conversion. Uh, the messaging translation between different variations of ISO 20022 or even ISO 20022 to other uh, um, formats, which is uh, complex. And uh, it must also, uh, we think is a tremendous opportunity here, but uh, to use automation, um, to use the APIs and, and, and the, 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 uh, the message flows that we've designed to support compliance operations. And in doing so, uh, actually help uh, introduce a, a higher degree of automation into things like uh, sanction screening, confirmation of PE, and some of the some of the other capabilities that are required to support a cross-border payment. Uh, settlement, of course, uh, this 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 model does build upon the risk models that are already in existence and does support both deferred net settlement and RT and real-time gross settlement. But obviously, there needs to be a, a coherent settlement and risk model uh, underpinning all of this. So the participants in a Nexus payment um, are illustrated on this chart. And, uh, and as I kind of go through a, a kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, view of what that payment experience would look like, um, all of these various parties are, are, are engaged uh, from the, from the kind of back-end perspective. Obviously, you've got the sender and receive, recipient in, in the uh, two jurisdictions. Uh, in the source country, you've got a source bank and a settlement account provider, uh, and that's where the first leg of the payment would be affected. Uh, in the destination country, the settlement account provider and the destination bank will, will, will be the second leg of the payment. And then this gateway will connect and, and communicate all of these parties, including FX providers in the middle. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of what a hypothetical sing dollar euro transaction would look like uh, in the Nexus world. And we'll try to look at it from the user's perspective. Um, Understanding that Nexus is not a uh, retail or a channel, there's no app. It's really a back-end wholesale service connecting instant payment systems, but sometimes it's a lot easier and nicer to just kind of illustrate the concept with a kind of a, a user's uh, perspective in mind. Um, before I do that, this is a, a quick kind of eye chart of all of the different steps in a payment. Um, and, and, and one thing that I always like to point out here is the second stack where all of the action is here in terms of payment setup is really looking at how do we front load uh, as much of the screening uh, and, and heavy lifting as possible to create the best possible user experience. Um, and, and, and that obviously does impose a lot of uh, potential change on, on the way uh, these flows work today. But we think that the importance of these payment setup operations are critical for success uh, in, in this Nexus Blueprint. Um, so yeah, I won't dive into this chart too much. This is again all on the the website, and 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 we certainly are uh, happy to take any questions as well. Um, but from a from a from a user's perspective, uh, this is a remittance use case where you know the user would log into their bank or their PSP app, and um, in terms of you know initiating this payment, it's as simple as selecting the country. Then you would want to uh, Nexus would then go and say, okay, well, what are the valid address formats for that country? Uh, in this case, you could use a phone number, uh, a local bank account number, uh, or an IBAN number. And so the user would have to figure out exactly how do they want to identify uh, the recipient. 
um, that that is a there's a lot of back end kind of uh, chatter in terms of ensuring that Nexus is aware of all those different formats and that of course they they can be input in a valid uh, you know in a valid way from the user. This is a simple example of the confirmation of payee flow where the uh, the source gateway and the destination gateway have to communicate with each other uh, in order to uh, send that request back to the destination bank to confirm the uh, receiver's identity and then be able to represent that back to the sender. This is much in the same way prompt pay, uh, pay now works actually. Um, Pre-approval, so sanction screening is another big uh, element in, in terms of cross-border payments obviously. Um, uh, Pre-screening, uh, pre-approval we think is, is, is an absolutely uh, critical way to, to you know, over time make something like this successful and scale. Uh, and, and, and again, here from a back-end perspective, this is sort of a, an illustration of all of the different message flows that happen uh, in, in the Nexus Blueprint. From that perspective now, the sender's been able to execute the conf confirmation of payee, so we know who we're sending this money to. The, the sender and the receiver have been pre-screened by the, the banks in, in, in the transaction, and we're pretty much ready to go. I'm sorry, we also, of course, have the FX rate quoted. Um, which uh, which I didn't go into detail over, but there there is a there is a, an effects rate quoting uh, mechanism um, where the uh, the banks in the scheme would would um, have a, a variety of different ways to configure uh, which FX provider, including themselves, that they would like to use uh, for cert for each currency pair, and um, and then obviously all of that um, would you know be presented back to the user. Again, the messages support this, but the UX and the UI design is entirely in the hands of the banks and the PSPs in this case. So with that, the payment is ready to be processed. Uh, this is a brief illustration of the, the payment flow. It's a two-legged payment. And so just really highlighting the fact that the first bank is, is deemed to be irrevocable. So the first leg is deemed irrevocable and final before the second leg is triggered. Um, so it's a sequential payment flow from a, um, from a, it, there, there are other ways to do this, but this is this is the way we've nominated to do this in in our in our uh, in our design. Um, then, excuse me, notifications obviously sent back to the respective participants, and everyone's happy. So that's the happy path, and understanding that there are uh, a, a very large number of unhappy paths when you need to trigger a cross border or even a domestic payment system. And in the blueprint, we've we've tried to articulate um, maybe not all, but most of those, and and make sure that the the design is capable of gracefully, uh, you know, failing and, and rolling back as as and when needed. Um, a quick word on the risk model, as I mentioned, Nexus is meant to be compatible with deferred net settlement systems, such as we have here in Singapore with FAST and in India with UPI, but also real-time gross settlement, real uh, you know, instant payments, such as what we have with um, Australia and uh, and TIPS. So it's really not contingent on the underlying risk model of the instant payment systems. Um, there is residual risk uh, a little bit for the FX providers in the, in the sense that there's a correspondent relationship uh, between the FX provider and the settlement account provider in the source country. And so like any correspondent banking relationship, um, their, their funds are held at that institution. And so there could be um, some residual risk there with respect to you know, bank failures in that case. Um, but that's something that we're um, going to dig in a little bit deeper to in our next phase of work. Um, briefly, next steps. So um, we published the blueprint, as I mentioned. We're now we've announced at the Singapore FinTech Festival that we are working with um, uh, Banca d'Italia, representing the uh, target uh, tips system, the, the uh, target instant payment system for the European region. Uh, um, BCS Nets here in Singapore, as well as the Monetary Authority of Singapore, of course and Banca Negra Malaysia and Paynet to uh, look at how this model could be um, you know, uh, deployed in a proof of concept environment. Again, to further refine it, we are going to be building a working uh, prototype and, uh, and elaborating much more uh, deeply on um, some of the complexities with respect to FX and liquidity management, with respect to message format translations, and, and also thinking through more deeply with some of the uh, commercial banks um, as to what kind of the implications of, of this would be on their own infrastructure and processes. Um, that's basically it. I uh, went pretty fast, Joe. I hope, I, hope I'm in time. It's usually a presentation we do in 45 minutes, 20 minutes or whatever. So uh, apologies if I was going too quickly, um, but certainly appreciate the time. And I'm not sure if we're 
uh, intending to take a few questions or I'll, I'll pass it back to you, I guess. Thank you so much, Andrew. And you know, I've heard this presentation a number of times, but it never gets old. Nexus is always fascinating. And I do have one question from uh, the audience uh, for you, Andrew. Sure. So this question is, uh, can you please elaborate a bit on what features the local, the local Nexus uh, should have? And the assumption is that the local Nexus would uh, be different a little bit one from another. So, um, how do you envisage that will work? And I think that's a, that's a really astute question to you, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question because not all payment systems are alike. Uh, even, even the same uh, uh, underlying vendor technology could be implemented in, in, a, in a number of different ways and, and payment flows can, can happen in different ways as well. You know, for example, um, confirmation of PE uh, exists here in Singapore, uh, but um, I know for at least at the time I left uh, the Canadian um, Payments Association, um, it was not part of the initial release for the uh, would-be upcoming instant payment system in Canada, which also happens to have the same underlying technology vendor, by the way. So, so there's an interesting kind of mismatch that can happen in terms of capabilities. And so that's something that we have to do is sort of level set as to what the absolute minimum bar is for this scheme to work. That's job number one. And then where you do have a heterogeneous environment, um, obviously there's a lot of translation that needs to be done between sort of the Nexus APIs, the way they need the information, um, you know, consumed or uh, risk requested or responded to, and then the way that information might be um, ultimately flowing through to the participant banks in the in the domestic scheme. So there's indeed quite a lot of work uh, done at that local gateway layer, um, whether whether it's just consuming a, a Nexus gateway or in fact embedding the, the Nexus APIs right into a domestic scheme and, and making sure that it's Nexus compliant. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, um, but um, indeed there's, there's quite a number of things that, that would have to be localized. Yeah, we do have our work cut out for us here in the POC. Very much looking forward to that. And thank, uh, thank you, Andrew, so much for sharing that with us. We'll now move on to the next item. Okay. Uh, Rama, I see you. Very good. Thank you. So we've covered a lot of ground today. Before we proceed to the second half of uh, the webinar, let's take a pause to digest the information that our speakers have generously shared. Uh, here to help us distill all these insights and share some views of her own, I have with me Ms. Ramas Rida, Executive Vice President at MasterCard for Business Development, Digital and Emerging Partnerships and New Payment Flows for Asia Pacific. At this juncture, I'd also like to invite members of the audience to send over any questions that you may have so we can use this time to go over some of these questions. Uh, but for now, Rama, over to you, please. Thank you, Joe, and it has certainly been uh, a very enriching couple of hours here in the evening for us in Singapore, but uh, the morning time from Europe. I am definitely glad to be a part of a forum that's fundamentally challenging how consumers, merchants, banks, regulators, countries, all of them interact in a global nation state. It's a fantastic vision that G20 has laid out, um, one in which collectively we are trying to optimize flows of over 150 trillion in payment value by 2022. When you kind of stare at the numbers, it becomes really mega. And I know a lot of the conversation today has been focused on the remittance flows, all the POC seem to have been focused on it as well. But let's not forget that there is $150 trillion in B2B flows, another $3 trillion in consumer to business flows, about $2 trillion, I think, in business to consumer flows, and then a $1 trillion in remittance flows. So particularly when we talk about the, the forward uh, state uh, of of infrastructure being on ISO 222, which we heard a number of times today, uh, all of these use cases open up uh, simultaneously. And perhaps in the larger vision, we should consider focusing on some of it as well. Now, while all roads may eventually lead to Rome, pardon the pun, 
what excites me is the growing ambition globally to pilot newer technology, accept more challenging targets, and almost unanimously today confirm to newer, more open standards. Now, the interconnectedness of real-time payment capability is definitely an exciting prospect, and it's probably the only way to realize the G20 vision of faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more inclusive cross-border payments, right? Uh, what I'd like to do is to take a couple of minutes and take stock. Now, all of us have said here today that connecting up domestic payment systems is the way forward. But while we do that, let's also look what is parallelly in play and how this might play out on a time dimension, maybe over the next three to five years. So if I can um, move on to Johan. So if you look at cross-border real-time payments today, um, I think it was already mentioned, right? So I definitely our colleague from Intesa San Paolo, Giancarlo said, right? There is correspondent banking network. There are the card networks, uh, global banks, are maybe operating closed loop payments. There are the FinTech players, digital currencies, blockchain might come up. And then there is real-time payments, right? Now, if we look at the world of real-time payments itself, the starting point is the proliferation of domestic RTP systems, right? Over this last one decade, we saw domestic RTP systems develop at a rapid pace from just a handful of them in 2010. Now we have over 60 systems, either live or in deployment in various stages. Today, RTP systems transfer about 92 trillion in value with 70 billion uh, estimated annual transactions. Now, the thing is, most of this is domestic. Most of the cross border activity today is really, we have to be grateful to uh, Europe and uh, you know, the Buna region for being pioneers in trying to interlink tips. Um, and of course, the Nordics is also implementing P27, but at this point in time, it's about its tips, right? And in GCC, you have Buna, and Africa is working on a pan-African infrastructure as well. Closer home to Asia, um, we have to credit MAS for pioneering the effort to create a number of bilateral schemes with all the national uh, operators in Thailand, in Malaysia, uh, in India. And we heard some of those mentioned both by Nendu and by Dennis, right? Um, I think as pilots go, we can safely say there are lots of them that are either underway um, or will get underway. But the real question is, where do we go from here? We can all probably safely align on the fact that going forward, we will see continued regional integration. This notion that one country's domestic scheme will suddenly connect across Pan-Atlantic or Pan-Europe or whatever and connect to individual countries is going to be uh, more like the spaghetti network that is in the long run uh, fairly um, you know, operationally uh, cumbersome to handle, if you like, right? So we will see continued regional integration. Now, it's natural that cross-border payments are first addressed within the regional neighborhood, uh, where the trade and travel corridors are normally very large. And some of that will happen with central regional infrastructure. But in my personal view, I don't believe this is the end of bilaterals. I do believe there'll be a further proliferation of bilaterals for some of the very good reasons that were mentioned by a colleague from Banca d'Italia, right? FX is a very good reason why bilaterals may continue to thrive. Now, the big question that how can we achieve a global network that interlinks what is already there on the domestic and regional level is, is really what we need to focus on. And that's why we are here today. Um, so what are those critical 
building blocks. The bulk of my conversation today is really going to be focused on perhaps bringing together some of the points that have already been made and laying this out in, in perhaps an easy to understand and execute format, right? What's being done towards establishing a multilateral cross-border network yet? I would argue we have significant momentum on the vision and the policy front. Now that's clearly a topic anchored in the G20 agenda, operationalized via FSB. With Nexus now under, you know, Andrew's been brilliant in creating the blueprint for a cross-border RTP scheme and defining a lot of the first level, second level rules as apparent, right? Some pilots already underway, we talked about it. We also have pilot initiatives to look at cross-border services with digital currencies and on blockchain. Um, close in Singapore, you have Project Partior and Dunbar as probably the examples there, right? And then we have FSB working towards a more definitive blueprint for most other blocks by 2023. This is really where we are, but what it takes to make this real and real at scale is execution. Execution is the real key. And so I would like to focus on what some of those execution blocks are that could make the scheme our cross-border real-time payment network or a scheme a success. For me, there are four big areas that stand out. The first one, even with a streamlined multilateral cross-border system that everyone spoke about today, we have all accepted that there will be a mix of solutions and systems to integrate. Now, hence, you need a set of minimum standards, and I, I think Andrew uh, from Nexus spoke about this, right? That ensures future interoperability between various systems. And that could include data formats, connectivity, KYC, AML compliance, and most likely it will need some mandates by central banks to their banks to drive compliance. If everyone has an option on this, that might become one of the most significant challenges for us to contend with. Standard setting bodies, we have a few, right? We have FSB, we have FATF, we have uh, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, CPMI for safety and efficiency. We have IMF for macro policy. We have WB World Bank for financial sector development. So we have a few of these entities who we can lean on. At a regional level, particularly from an Asia perspective, I know that there is a lot of activity to define standards, for example, in Southeast Asia, to harmonize QR standards across markets. So that's the first thing, right? The second one, in order to build a multilateral system, the central questions of governance needs to be agreed. Who owns the scheme? Who is the scheme manager and operator? Nexus has laid out the blueprint, but who is the owner? Who's the manager? Who's the operator? Who sets the standards and continually updates them? Um, the SLAs, the guidances on settlement, the participant requirements, dispute management, for example, we heard um, that the way Thailand might be ha handling some of the transaction um, detail is very different to how Singapore handles it. In a global cross-border multinational network, is that okay or do we want to address that is I think an open question. The other one that I want to raise is the Nexus Blueprint foresees that there is no new brand being established. Is that a question to consider? Would a brand help build recognition with all the participants? If, if it's not there, how will you build the trust the users need to push the send money button, particularly for physical retail payments? Because that's really where uh, the card networks have built an edge because of the trust factor. The third block really is the infrastructure and technology bill. Of course, we've all spoken about this huge amount of work to be done in detailing specifications of requirements, et cetera. Um, and, and we also debated a lot on the spaghetti versus the multilateral network. 
I foresee some on behalf connectivity services, similar to what gateways do in the cards world today, and some existing systems in a market or a region perhaps can already scale up for global service as well and become an integral part of the system design. All of these pilots will provide us very valuable inputs, but it will require the inputs and the engagement, I dare say, of a much broader range of stakeholders, a broad range of central banks and perhaps potential customers, many, many more banks and many, many fintechs as well. And once the specs is done, the system actually needs to be built and operated. So managing the operations, including the support, maintenance, and deployment of new enhancements, or you know, the decisions on a build yourself versus buy outsource, all of these are very heavy operational decisions, and um, and we need to settle on on the entity that could perhaps uh, do all of this uh, to create this global payment network. Last but not the least, and I know digital currencies came up in a few conversations, I've never mentioned this explicitly. Any new system needs to be forward compatible. So we can, we can, it's obvious that at the same time, not all markets or the central banks will have a digital currency. So the system needs to either accommodate uh, both or, or be able to uh, introduce digital currencies as they come along. You may or may not want two parallel systems because if you don't make it forward compatible with digital currencies, three years out, there will be yet another parallel system just for central bank digital currencies. So, so far I've talked about the system build, but we can agree that success is defined by actually seeing a good share of the transaction volumes going through the system and not just having an infrastructure. So the execution elements become very important to address the reasons why a multilateral cross-border scheme could actually fail. Understanding the failure points perhaps makes it easier for us to, uh, you know, move forward to create success, right? So if we can look at now what the execution roadmap could be. We talked about the critical components of a multilateral cross-border network. The steps required to get there is what I would like to talk about next. In my mind, there are three pragmatic steps. You and maybe we can move forward, please. Three pragmatic steps. Uh, and, and I just gently want to suggest that this is a suggestion based on what I believe are critical success factors. Let's talk about those reasons of failure. Uh, many reasons that the whole scheme could fail. The first is banks do not sign up to the scheme, either because they don't believe in it or they find it too difficult to connect. If they start connect, banks do not put significant volumes through the scheme. Why? Because it's not attractive to them. And that's, that could be due to the economics or alternate networks. The third reason is the, the users might find the experience inconvenient. If the system requires too many IDs and parameters that the users are not uh, familiar with in the domestic systems. Another reason could be that the consumers and merchants are just unfamiliar on how the system operates and don't know what to use it for. Trust is a very important one. If the scheme is not trusted by banks or users, i.e. from a fraud incidence or dispute management, et cetera, then that becomes a big uh, bottleneck as well. Low quality operations, which is always a real risk, is another big factor to consider. Any one of these or a combination of these could cause failure and therefore, the first step are what I call the no regret activities, things that need to be done irrespective of the eventual design of a multilateral system. Concluding those pilots that we all spoke about, codifying and sharing those learnings in exchange forums like this is an obvious first thing 
that will give us insights into what the minimum technical data and compliance standards to facilitate uh, interoperability between components should be. And I imagine these are already being defined and published uh, in recommendations that local regulators and players can already use. The next is really an assessment on what are the options for building a multi-reactor scheme. Can it be done with the existing infrastructure? Do we need a new central hub or a system? Should digital currencies already be a part of the design? And last, not, in, not least though, in the next two years, we need many, many, many more participants to be recruited into this effort. More central banks, more scheme operators to broaden the corridors of the currencies being covered, but also banks and other payment participants. If we do all this, we will achieve three things at the end of phase one, a coalition of the willing to move ahead, clarity around minimum standards and clarity around what kind of new infrastructure is needed. If you do stage one, we will land with these three clear uh, go forward spaces, right? The second thing really is the build of a multilateral cross-border payment system. As a start, we talked about governance and scheme and decision rights and entity and all of that, not gonna repeat that. But another important aspect of the governance is how does the public and private sector work together to build the system? And I imagine quite a few private players will need to come to the table. What capabilities would you build within the scheme manager? What would you outsource is an important decision along with creating the requirements uh, that need to be fairly specific as well. At the end of this phase, we will have a multilateral scheme that's ready for launch and a broader part participation in this launch that should give us confidence that a minimum scale can be achieved. But in order to achieve the scale, the work is not done with building the multilateral system, right? The big thing is to get the economics right. And I know we are all talking about 10 to 15% coming down to three to 5% to 1%, um, but we need to look at all the players and, and, and ensure that they have a reason to participate and getting the economics right is, is absolutely critical. We need to look at incentives for those who decide to give the transactions to this multilateral system versus the others that we will compete with. I think uh, this was referred to in the FX conversion conversation earlier uh, within the Bank d'Italia segment, right? This means that both the cost to the participant, but also the ability to earn revenue as all the banks and, cross, uh, and providers have cross-border services as a revenue generating service today. Uh, they need to be compensated and to stay motivated. Now looking for specific use cases within the cross-border category, that will increase the scope and use of the system as well. We all spoke about remittances today, but like I mentioned in my opening comments, there are more other important use cases, disbursements from marketplaces, proxy, value-added tax for B2B, request to pay for e-commerce services, SME procurements, retail investment flows, salaries and commission payments, medical travel. There are many, many use cases that we could potentially peel into. And lastly, two points. Participation needs to go beyond banks to include fintechs and tech platforms uh, that fulfill the minimum requirements. And I know MAS is hugely committed to this year. Um, and, and it's needed, all of these engagement activities are needed independent of what the multilateral system looks like, whether it's a central infrastructure, distributed system, um, or, or any other, um, you know, model that, that comes up. I hope uh, I, what I've been able to do is to create a practitioner's version of, of a sequence of actions uh, with a certain RAG status on it that should uh, enable us all to prioritize some over the others. Thank you. Joe? Thanks, Rama. Thanks for uh, so excellently encapsulating the content that has been shared also by our previous speakers. 
And uh, we had reserved some time uh, for questions from the audience. The audience today is slightly coy. The team has some questions for you. If you don't mind, maybe we'll just take a couple of them from the team. Rama, so today's uh, webinar focused on payments interoperability. So just to get your quick views on the continued relevance of other pillars of uh, foundational digital infrastructure. For example, can payments be pursued as a standalone or must countries also devote some efforts to, you know, developing other tracks as well? And in this regard, you know, what tangible benefits can be had from uh, unlocking multiple pillars, uh, foundational digital infrastructure, as opposed to just having, you know, the one on payments? So, Joe, you, you, you caught me on my favorite topic, really, and we could spend an entire session on what drives digital inclusion, arguably the favorite topic of every central bank, because, you know, there is a lot of digital dividend that could drive up a couple of points of GDP growth, and I think everyone is focused on that. Um, but digital and financial inclusion, to me, is... Um, might be primarily solved in each market, of course, using global standards and international examples, uh, but the cross-border aspect uh, is remittances, of course, right? Um, I would argue less costly or faster remittances will actually not solve for inclusion if the recipients stay in a cash economy without a digital identity without a safe account to store funds and without the choices to make payments digitally. So for this exercise of establishing a multilateral cross-border payment network, um, I suggest to initially stay within the payment problems and add in the cross-border elements for digital identity or open banking when they are available. So point I'm making is all of it is required digital identity to ensure authentication and validation of identity individual, as well as protecting the security and privacy of the information, right? Um, authorization and consent to ensure transparent, secure digital transactions. Payment interoperability, of course, we all spoke about payment interoperability and data exchange, because if you want to create a flourishing ecosystem, then you need to open up the banking domain and the customer information domain to fintechs and all other service providers as well. So a long answer, but in order to create a vibrant digital payment uh, ecosystem, you need to solve for domestic and cross-border, but solving for domestic in digitally includes these four things that I spoke about, which needs to seamlessly extend to cross-border as well. That's nice. I think we have some alignment here. Uh, that's why uh, in Singapore at the MES, we also work quite hard to make sure that there is good and open access to uh, many fintech firms alongside uh, traditional uh, banks and financial institutions. For example, we have opened up uh, direct access to FAST uh, to also fintech firms that are eligible to participate. Now, I have an interesting question from uh, the audience here. And uh, this one says from uh, Salvat Raj says, how could we participate in building solutions? I suppose this is uh, from the industry perspective. Do we need to come via a sponsor bank or a local organization? Or, you know, do we build on top of existing infrastructure? So I suppose some of this depends on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So uh, Rama, your views, please. And I suppose we could take the Singapore context here or another one as well. So maybe I, I, um, I don't know when they say solutions, what it means. So maybe I just give it from the perspective of how it could perhaps be attempted, right? If, if it is the fundamental infrastructure, that's the, the technology product that will fire up a cross-border payment, including settlement and clearing and all of that, then that definitely in the current scheme of things is working with the domestic scheme operators um, and perhaps Nexus, right? So 
that's what I call the infrastructure layer. The second layer is really the rules part of it, which at this point in time clearly looks in the bilateral uh, networks, it looks to be a mutually decided book of rules, which hopefully under the Nexus blueprint will, will normalize into a more common set of rules. And I did say it's an open question on who will drive the scheme and who will monitor and manage that scheme. But I think this question is perhaps much more in terms of the applications that will ride the um, cross-border infrastructure. And that to me is something that you should just independently build because I'm actually not sure that we need um, to restrict or permit people to build more and more offerings uh, for example, in Singapore, there is pay now already, and anything that you want to build on top of pay now, and that should be seamlessly connected to prompt pay, is something that you should be able to build and work with the bilateral um, scheme and try and implement that, right? But then if it becomes a multilateral network, then whichever is the uh, entity that's been given the agency to, to, to include more and more efforts applications would become the logical one. The tough point at this stage is we don't have a specific answer, but I wanted to give a framework of how to approach it. Does that make sense? It does. And now, Rama, I thought I could ask you also a favorite question that we like to ask panelists, and we just came out of the Singapore FinTech Festival. Always good to get experts' views on this subject of collaboration between public and private sector being crucial to driving the success of a global community in tackling you know, cross-border payment challenges as outlined by the G20. So are there any particular aspects or areas of collaboration you think uh, would require more attention or more effort from the global community? So I said this, I think, in my opening comments. Um, I believe including banks early on is critical for execution. Uh, we cannot build something and hope, uh, hope is not a good strategy here, right? So we just need to make sure that banks are committed to doing it. There is a soft way of doing it, getting the economics right, uh, motivating them, um, you know, demonstrating successful POCs and all of that. And then there is the mandate idea. Right, I think that is very important because they are the ones who are deciding where to send the payment volumes. So this idea of the coalition of the willing for the minimum initial scale is a very crucial one. Uh, the second is, as a part of the coalition, we need a select group of non-bank players, the fintechs and the tech platforms, because digital engagement is critical to, to to triggering customer adoption, right? And we all can safely accept that most of us do our digital transactions through technology platforms and apps um, much more than perhaps banking apps, unfortunately, right? And therefore, co-opting a lot of them into the initial coalition is very important to, to try and set up uh, all of this for success, right? Uh, a lot of the use cases do originate, and that's really where the digital experiences. The third part, really, and I won't, uh, I won't, I'm not self-serving, but I'm saying this, you want to include the payment providers, such as ourselves, right? Unless you want to build everything from scratch and do it all, um, uh, while, while a global network has been created on card rails and does, uh, seamlessly extend to the account to account payment rails, what is available underlying is three things really. The technology, the experience of doing governance of schemes um, and managing, you know, uh, hundreds of currencies really across. And the third thing really is the big layer of dispute resolution and fraud management and security of transactions and forward compatibility with, shall we say, blockchain, 
all of that because this takes a lot of investment and if you want to keep the costs manageable at some point in time while maintaining a cutting edge of technology democratizing costs across a wider base of transactions becomes very important thank you rama and i thought before we uh, close off the first session of this webinar uh, would be very odd for us to let this go without any question on CBDCs, Rama. So how do you think CBDCs is, uh, are going to change the game for all these linkages we have worked so diligently on? Uh, so you have saved all your tough questions for me, Joe. Um, of course, I, I know that you will rise to the occasion. <laughs> um, will they be a game changer and will they be a game changer for the various linkage that we spoke about i think is the real underlying question here right uh, so i will differentiate uh, two aspects let's segregate it one is the currencies and one is blockchain as a technology right um, digital currencies will come eventually when they get beyond the speculative they get beyond the illicit they they win the affection of central banks such as yourself and they make um, and they show that they want to stay compliant to regulation because anything that's out of compliance with regulation is not even something under consideration for any of us right um, to me any payment system will need to be able to handle digital currencies at some point uh, and by the way even in our not network it will seamlessly extend into digital currencies so to me stable coins and central bank digital currencies as a way forward is already incorporated perhaps into the roadmap of all those entities who are forward thinking now using blockchain in a multilateral cross-border network is a technology question it's not it's not a is it a good to do or not to do question, right? It's a technology question that I do believe uh, needs a lot more thinking and analyzing. Uh, anything that takes disintermediation out is good and bad at the same time. And I think the net of it is what needs to be considered. And I, I, I do believe today we spoke about this in one of the segments. Um, are we investing in the space? Yes. Um, our crypto card program is live that allows fintechs to issue um, MasterCard using a crypto wallet as a funding source. Uh, but we are also, like I said, enabling digital currencies directly on the network so that the merchants can accept digital currencies and the transaction can remain native without conversion into fiat. So we're trying to do that, but of course we would only do that for stable coins and CBDCs um, because you don't, we're not into the space of encouraging volatile currencies, which, which we really don't understand, right? So um, they, we also have launched a sandbox and a test platform that will allow central banks to test out uh, various aspects of designing and using a digital currency, which includes in profitability with payment systems. So, CBDCs will come, um, I don't know how, how quickly, um, and we will just need to consume them as we move forward without compromising any of the other payment principles. Indeed, and this space moves so quickly, I think the future is already with us. And thank you so much, Rama, for your very insightful comments and for this uh, very robust discussion. So this brings us to the end of the first half of this webinar. Uh, it leaves me to thank our audience for your very kind attention. On behalf of the organizing committee and all our participants, so once again, we thank our speakers for their very valuable contributions today. Uh, session two of the webinar will begin at around 2.30 Central European time, that's 9.30 Singapore time. We do have a good 
almost two hours for lunch in Europe, uh, dinner in Singapore, and after all that talk about Spaghetti Network, I'm sure we are all hungry. And uh, on behalf of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, can I just say that it has been an absolute pleasure working with our colleagues at Banca d'Italia to bring this to you. Uh, it has been a privilege to host you. We will see you back here after break. Thank you. Thank you.